Hi, I'm Marina Bordereau from the Be Natural podcast, and you are listening to the U.S. Modernist Radio. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Before the internet, the only way most people saw modernist architecture was through magazines, many of which no longer exist, like Progressive Architecture, Arts and Architecture, and Architectural Forum, plus some that continue, like Architecture Record and Architect. From the 20s through the 70s, those modernist houses and buildings were photographed, largely in black and white, by a generation of photographers that are all gone. Photographers like Joseph Molitor, Julius Shulman, Robert DeMora, Ken Hedrick, Edward Van Altena, Marvin Rand, Gordon Schenk, and Ezra Stoller. Today, we welcome two authors of a new book on Ezra Stoller, his daughter, Erica Stoller, and returning podcast guest, Pierluigi Serraino, who you'll recall from our X-Files show. Plus, we welcome back guest co-host, Bob Langford. Hey, Bob. It is so cool to be here. <laughs> and now, despite getting in six hours late in a flight that should have only taken one hour, here's your host, George Smart. Hi, folks. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. You know, um... I was on Delta, which is otherwise a very, very nice airline. <laughs> Except for all the airline part. <laughs> Except for some of the problems they have with um, lying over the course of <laughs> six hours. I mean, it just got to be hilarious. You go up to the desk and I'd say, well, how long is it going to be? And they say, oh, just another 20 minutes. The plane is already in range. And then I go on my phone and look up the flight, and it hadn't even left Washington, D.C. yet. Well, it depends on your definition of range. Right. <laughs> you, know, you were in New York, I assume. Yes, I was in New York, and it just got crazier. And then they told us it was all transponders. But they weren't sure whether it was the transponders on the plane mm -hmm. or on the ground that were causing this communication issue. Yeah. Then they said it was weather. But they wouldn't tell us where the weather was. It certainly wasn't in New York or Washington, according to my radar. To be fair, all these things are from a list, What to Tell Passengers, <laughs> that was written about 1977. And then loaded into a magic eight ball <laughs> and given so to the... You had no, there, were no, there was no recourse in 1977 other than to nod politely and yeah. try to find a bar. Right. Yeah. yeah. U.S. Marnus Radio is underwritten by Angela Roll. Episode 6, Return of the Modernists. <laughs> I love reading these. In our continuing imaginary space saga, Princess Angela Roll returns to her home planet of Vanderoa to rescue the iconic Saroyan Villa from the evil Max McMansion. <laughs> Despite being designed by architect Tad Vader, Darth's second cousin on the dark side, Princess Angela is determined to save the historic modernist villa with galactic historic tax credits and her new <laughs> ion-powered circular saver saw. Those are the best, the ion-powered. Yeah. Angela has no idea what she's walking into. It could be a trap. It's a trap. As the Empire begins building a massive new development called Deathville Acres with houses <laughs> of- Good marketing. <laughs> with houses of 250,000 square feet, garage not included, it spells doom for her brave, modernist rebels struggling to restore great architecture. Centuries earlier, back in 2019, you can count on Princess Angela's great, 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 great granddaughter. That's a lot of greatness. It's pretty great. A real estate agent with specialized design training, advising buyers and sellers of modernist houses on everything from appropriate renovation to knowing that a parsec is a unit of distance, not of time. <laughs> if you get that reference, you're a true Star Wars fan. Among other things. <laughs> At least. Angela Roll, she is your special real estate agent. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or call 919-995-0550. Thank you, Bob. It's always great to have you back. Back in 2019. Yes, back in 2019. <laughs>
Our guest, Erica Stoller, is the director of ESTO, an agency representing architectural photographers and managing the massive archives of images of architecture based on the work of her father, Ezra Stoller. He was one of the very best photographers of mid-century modernism, and his work lives on in the ESTO archive used by scholars, photo researchers, and publishers worldwide. In addition to running ESTO, Erica is a photographer and is also known as an artist, making wall sculptures of repurposed industrial materials like plastic plumbing tubes, foam insulation, parachute cord, cable ties, bead chain, wire rope, and metal connectors. All things I have in my garage, I think. Welcome, Erica. Hello. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Returning guest, Pier Luigi Saraina is an architect and author whose book, Modernism Rediscovered, contributed to the huge reemergence of interest in the architecture that, well, that we all know and love. Oh, yes. He's been published in Architectural Record, Architecture California, the Journal of Architectural Education, Architectural Design, and he's written books on Aero Saarinen, NorCal Mod, Icons of Northern California Modernism, California Captured with our pals Emily Bills and Sam LaBelle. And his newest co-authored with Erica Stoller, Ezra Stoller, a photographic history of modern American architecture. Pierre Luigi, welcome. Glad to be here. We're thrilled to have you. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you both, really. This is going to be an exciting book coming out. I wanted to start with, how did the two of you meet? Well, I, I think that Pierre Luigi has been a presence in the architecture world, well, worldwide, but also uh, personally in, in the Bay Area. and I believe that he got to know Ezra's brother, Claude, who was an architect and uh, a professor at Berkeley, and they crossed paths about lectures and, and events. And as I understand, Pierre Luigi began to talk to Claude about, well, what about Ezra? What about looking more closely at that work? And uh, it sort of followed into this. Is that, did I have that right, Pierre Luigi? Correct. Uh, we, um, Eric and I, had a, an interaction through Claude Stoller, who I had suggested as a uh, speaker uh, for the Monterey Design Conference in uh, uh -huh. 2015. And we started having that conversation uh, through that. And as I spoke with Claude, whom I met through Don Olson, uh, an important architect in the Bay Area that we're both faculty at UC Berkeley, I then uh, um, realized that uh, uh, some of his work had been photographed by Ezra. And I always felt uh, that there was something missing in the literature of Ezra. I, I knew of his enormity, but I also had the distinct feeling that there was uh, a lot more in the archive that I had been exposed to. So I simply asked uh, Claude, uh, said, how would you feel if uh, I did uh, some work on Ezra's archive? And he was very gracious. Uh, Claude is a, a really, really, really wonderful person, just in general, whether, uh, besides being a great architect. And so he was very gracious, just approached uh, Erica and sent an introductory email, and Erica was uh, super open. Uh, I was actually a little intimidated early on, because I knew that she was the driving force of ESTO. But she was surprisingly welcoming, and uh, I have to say I had the best collaboration ever with anyone on this book. This book that would have never happened without Erica's incredible efficiency. Well, and the fact is also Pierluigi was looking at approaching the work in a different way. You know, it's always been that Ezra sort of in the shadow of the architect, and he's looking at the photography as a way of describing the architecture in, in a broader sense. Also, one must say that this book really is a biography. But it's not only a biography of the photographer, which it is. It's divided into four chapters that are roughly chronological, but also sort of thematic. And so he's talking about technical issues, and he's talking about how the work is seen and how the work is published. And it becomes kind of a, an interesting weave where you're looking for, you've got the, the vertical issues and then the horizontal issues. And they, where they not together is where he really made a, a whole, told a whole new story. Can you give us a little preview of the story in the book and tell us a little bit about how your father came into photography in the first place. Well, he kind of came into it by accident, I think, because he'd always been sort of a not very good student, and he found that he was better at drawing and imagining space in a different way than talking about it with words and, and worrying about spelling and worrying about grammar and so on. So he 
he ended up in a sort of technical high school, and I think when he took a course in mechanical drawing, it kind of opened a new way of expressing himself. He did go to architecture school, but he never took an architecture degree. He Where was he going to school? He was at NYU. Okay. He was always very proud of himself because they had an architecture school, which they closed in 1938, which was the year he graduated. He always sort of liked to say that he broke the school. He broke it, <laughs> they had to close it, you know. So, um, and all while, while he was in school, and this is described in great detail in Pierre Luigi's research and in the book, um, he sort of had a school job in the slide library. What was that called? The Lantern Slides. And then he began to use a camera and photograph things. If there was a team of artists, architects, and a photographer, he'd then be d- documenting the model they built or um, helping to describe the project in a different way than just with pencil on paper. So he was always involved in that. And this was, this was in the Depression, and there weren't many jobs. You remember how the economy is so greatly helped by wars. That yeah. pulled us all out of it. But um, I think his, he thought he'd just be a sort of a pencil pusher, and he had this other skill that had been developing. And there were a few episodes in school where he got to photograph something which was then submitted to a publication, won an award. And so he began to know the, the path around from, from the architect to the editor and to the publisher. And he began to be kind of a nexus of some of those things. He, he could help architects get their work to the magazine. He'd help the magazine find the work when he was in traveling to different parts of the country. He acted almost as a scout. So it, it was a, an interesting connection. The, the photography really drew together other people and, and made him kind of the catalyst for some of this work. Is that fair to say? Do you agree with that, Pierre Luigi? Oh, totally. I have come to realize a number of different phenomena uh, through this uh, work on Etra. I want to say that uh, having seen many archives, uh, Etra's work is a, of a completely different league. Ezra is a textbook case of the creative, uh, as uh, outlined in the Creative Architect book. I mean, he had a, a complicated adolescence. Uh, uh, he was very, very intense. Uh, he didn't care for school until he found his interest, and then his interest completely absorbed him, and he was an incredibly principled person. It was very, very uh, moving to more work on this book. I mean, I learned a standard of uh, existence, let's put it like that. Often when one starts to look at someone's work, you look at the easy way, which is to look at what's been published. And that's really a kind of plagiarism, if you think about it. It's kind of visual plagiarism to only publish what's been seen before. Pierre Luigi went as far back as possible. I mean, he looked at every image that he'd made. And he also read reams of, of notes. We don't have all the correspondence from the beginning, which is a shame. But he did a kind of research that means he knows about this man's work better than anybody, better than we do. Well, uh, for me, I, I had to understand where this intensity was coming from. Because knowing Claude, who's a very gentle person, who, you know, went, entered Berlin in 1945 as a Jew, oh. <laughs> you can imagine, he could be in a completely different mindset, but he's just uh, happy as a cucumber, as a person. Whereas Ezra is an incredibly, incredibly intense person. It commands uh, your attention. His photographs stop time. I mean, I was opening these files, and it was like just missile, boom! I just could not stand still. Per Luigi, tell us who some of who some of Ezra's clients were. Who are we talking about here? There were clients uh, that were are, are quite well known. Uh, hundreds of jobs done for Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, mm-hmm. both New York and Chicago in their golden age, especially the legacy of Gordon Banshaft and uh, some of, the, of Bruce Graham. He also ventured out occasionally to San Francisco, did work uh, for Chuck Bassett. Edward Durrell Stone, a monumental portrayal of his work, both in the modernist vein and in the more neoclassical type of phase of his career. Great surprises uh, were uh, Harrison and Abramovitz, a firm that is fairly inconspicuous uh, in the books on architecture, but in fact that they were really, really, really talented architects. This was Wallace Harrison, right? Wallace Harrison, yes. And they did work uh, that was really, really remarkable. The Corning Museum of Glass is one. 
the Rockefeller House in uh, uh, Maine was another one. Great inspired work uh, of a standard that I would have never imagined based on the literature that is available. Complete uh, coverage of the work of Yaka, uh, Nakashima in uh, Philadelphia. Paul Rudolph, uh, great, great, great uh, assignments done and coverage. He really believed in that work, and when he loved that work, uh, he gave everything that he had uh, for those jobs. So you cannot not respond emotionally and viscerally to these images, and it's the sheer quality of them that is just staggering. You, know, so you can have a certain intuition, so you have some, uh, an eye stopper, you have three eye stoppers, but when you have hundreds, then there is an approach that is almost infallible to how you tell the story of a space through photography. A consistent but never old, disciplined, pure, and unspoiled by commercial intent, even though he said he was a commercial photographer. Uh, but he took his art with a remarkable rigor, and it shows all the way to the end. For, I would say that to a large extent, the initial fortunes of Richard Meyer were the result of, of Edra's uh, glorious illustration of those early houses. Most of these photographs were in black and white, correct? Uh, not necessarily. There was a significant amount of uh, color. The color will all be scanned. I found some color of Paul Rudolph that I had never seen before, and that's a bit like the challenge of this book. I gave initially close to 7,000 images uh, to Fiden, and, you know, Erica said, you know, it just makes no sense. So I said, okay, I'm going to go do another turn. I'm going to be really severe, and it was down to 6,000. So <laughs> <laughs> I just cannot not include these images. <laughs> I mean, it's just like I feel I'm leaving out something. And ultimately, in the book, only a few hundreds made it. So there are a lot of outtakes. It just tells a story that it's impossible to, to really account for an archive in one publication. But you can point to, to the vastness of the project of architectural photography, of which uh, Stoller was uh, acutely aware of. I, I mean, Stoller was not just a photographer with a camera. He was fundamentally a producer of architectural knowledge, and he knew that. And so he photographed accordingly. Well, and also, he would photograph something completely, whether the assignment was or not. But I like that line about photographer what producer of architectural knowledge? Of architectural oh, knowledge. That, that, that's a great one. Okay, I'm writing it down. Um, <laughs> you did know, for the next know, book. He, didn't, yes. he, he would spend quite a long time walking around, figuring it out, studying not only the space and the shape and the use, but also the natural light. And, and so he, you know, if he showed up in the afternoon and walked all around, he didn't take out the camera for quite some time. Maybe not that day, maybe not even the next day. And he made a kind of a plan, sometimes on the back of an envelope, sometimes on a squiggle piece of paper, sometimes just in his head. And he knew that in the morning you had to be over here, and then you'd move around with the sun. Maybe you had a long lunch in the middle of the day because the sun at the highest was not the best time of day to photograph. And then he would make each of those images however they happened to be done. You know, the afternoon, you'd start at the back of the building, and you'd move around to the front. Then very carefully, when the film was processed, he, he worked on the black and white proofs. He put them all in order. And the numerical order was not the order in which they were made. It was to give you a sense of procession. You arrived, uh, came down the street, and you walked around the corner, and you saw the building, and then you saw how to get into it and move through it. So that sequence was very important to him. He was creating an experience. Yes, but of course, at the same time, he knew he was working with an art director who was looking for a cover shot. And probably six or eight pages, if you got a big story, it was, that was all that was seen. But it didn't really matter to him because he had that responsibility. You know, he was deciding to tell the whole story. And um, he also then would present a full set of prints to the client, sometimes just loose prints. Sometimes they were actually bound into a spiral book because he wanted everybody to respect the order, the travel up to it, through it, and how you could sort of see one space leading into a next the next. Through a door, you'd see the next room, and then you'd go in there and, and work your way through the building. So it was, it was that kind of experience that mattered. It wasn't just finding 
a nice picture. It's as if he was creating a storyboard. Yeah. Like yeah. for a movie. To me, what is fascinating is his ability to restrain himself. I mean, if you imagine that you have a huge buffet and you don't start eating, you just look at it and look at the table and look at all the dishes and you do an inventory of every single part of it and then you make a plan of which one you're going to eat first in that sequence and you execute the plan. No matter how delicious that buffet is, you just don't jump into the buffet. And so that was uh, you don't. The same I, I do that all the time. Him. Really, don't <laughs> fill up. Don't fill up on well, bread. <laughs> well, with photography, I mean, with those spaces, uh, they were so beautiful, and yet he would not take the photograph. I mean, it takes uh, an enormous amount of discipline, inner discipline, which uh, no one told him. He came up with that approach himself, and often he was by himself. We also have to remember. But you just had so much film with you. You know, you'd load the film in the I morning. I was going to say that you had film isn't free. Black and white and color film. You knew that you had, what, 20, 30 magazines, and that's all you could, that was it. So you had to figure out your day's work. Otherwise, you had to go back, find a room somewhere, tape it to be dark so you could load more film. I mean, it's almost impossible to remember that now that we're working with digital material. It's just endless. You can shoot anything and edit it later. It had to be planned ahead of time. It was all meticulously done. Yeah, meticulously, but also, the, you know, knowing that not all the work was going to be published. I mean, there are two instances that come to mind. The coverage of the Four Foundation by uh, Roach and Dinkelow. There were maybe like 112 photographs. I mean, it was like an enormous amount. Uh, and they were so beautiful. And he knew that just only a few would make into the magazine, and not in the sequence that he, he thought about. And they would be cropped as well. The second thing was that something that really hit me uh, when I interviewed Richard Meyer on his relationship with Story said that when Ezra would photograph the work, you would know that the work is really finished. And there's nothing else you can do for that piece of architecture. It's sort of sealed in history. And in a way, it confirms that uh, as buildings are so vulnerable to, you know, fires or new owners or market changes, photography is the record keeper of all that has been. And with this level of uh, visual distinction, it's no surprise that when historians go and tell the story of modern architecture, the pictures of Ezra are more and more prominent. But the thing that I find even more staggering is that it's not acknowledged. <laughs> and that's what Eric and I keep you know, going back and forth through emails. I mean, it's just unbelievable that I'm quoting her now, just pictures seems to happen. But that's not true. They never happen. There's always someone that makes a decision, and the decision is often made by the photographer. So the, that's a huge missing piece of all this architectural story. There is no great architecture without a great photograph. It's absolutely clear to me, because uh, the building is unaccountable without the visual. Ezra was always very careful about the semantics. When people talk about, well, when you can take the picture from here, he said, I don't take a picture. I make a picture. <laughs> That's good. And it always seemed a little, okay, a little hoity-toity, but he really meant that, you know, it didn't just happen. It wasn't there to sweep up off the floor or pick up from some postcard rack. It was, when you think about the idea of capturing light and getting it just so. And he didn't have Photoshop. He didn't have much to do. Afterwards, there were certain things you could do in printing. Uh, color was even more problematic because there were different colored lights and you couldn't, you know, you had to balance things very, in a very kind of complicated and time-consuming way. But uh, he would make it. That was clear. Erica, tell us about your dad on a shoot of the Chase Manhattan Bank in New York. Oh, well, I didn't know about the whole shoot. I was just there at the very last day. It was a project that was near where, you know, we, we, we lived and had the studio outside of New York City. So this was a job in New York. And he'd been there on several occasions. And then the last day, I guess, he needed one more shot just to finish the whole documentation. And um, there was nobody around to go with him. He didn't have an assistant that day. So I was volunteered to come along. And so we drove down and parked the car walk through the city, set up in the corner that he needed to be in, and nothing happened. And I kept thinking, well, well, you know, I'd say, so, what What now? And he said, well, you see these tall size skyscrapers? In about 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes, 
the sun will come through that opening between those two buildings and the sun will pass across the plaza, we'll make the photograph, and then we'll go home. And so we stood there, and, you know, I always felt that it was a little bit backwards. It wasn't he responding to the sun, but he sort of told the sun what to do. <laughs> he, he knew exactly where the sun would be at what time, and he knew uh, what to expect, and it behaved itself. It did just that. And how'd the photo come out? fine. It's just fine. I mean, in the end, at the very last minute, somebody came and sat down in the, right in the foreground. I had to go and tell this man to move. But, uh, <laughs> well, it, that's foreground it, interest. Foreground. It just did it for him. And, you know, another funny thing is I, when I buy a package of seeds, you know, to plant in the garden, and it says plant after the last frost, yeah, I always thought it was funny because it said after the last frost. Well, I don't know the last frost. I mean, I know the one before, but I don't know when it will be the last one. If you're a farmer, you know those things, right? Well, yeah, I guess you that. look in the almanac and it tells you. Somebody wrote that. He could have written the almanac about where the light was. You know, if the sun was coming in at 3.15 today, it's going to be 3.23 tomorrow, you know, because right. the light is changing. And it's, it's all it's very sort of basic. It's about universal. It's about the solar system. It's about how do you live with the world around you that most of us just take for granted, you know. Mother Nature's big key light. I guess. The sun. Yep. You have to know yes. how it works. I never heard Carl Sagan refer to it quite that way, Tom. But yeah. Thank <laughs> you for that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I think the key light's getting brighter these days. <laughs> yeah. Erica, what was your dad like as a person when you were 12 years old eating dinner? Well, what did you guys talk about? I have no idea. He was always quite preoccupied with his work and... He came home in between, but he was uh, pretty much of an absent parent, you know. And when he was home, he was also concerned with his work. So that's that's what it was. Did you have brothers and sisters? I have two younger brothers, yeah. And my mother kind of had to hold the thing together for when we were younger. The office was adjacent to the house, and uh, she was sort of expected to keep an eye on things. It was really a bit too much for her. Mm. It, was, it, was, it was complicated. How much was he gone? You look at those job lists. If you look in the back of the Yale book, it tells you how many things he did in the course of a year. You look in the 50s and the 60s, he wasn't around much. Did that help you or take you away from photography for yourself? Well, I don't know that I needed to be in photography myself, but I guess it made me interested in what on earth he was doing because I kind of hung around and ended up doing sort of an extension of that myself. And your brothers, did they go into photography? No. Well, one is, a, one is an architect and a furniture designer. Uh, the other is in a completely different field. So a little bit of architecture seeped through the DNA. Right, yes. Right. I think it was sort of an, an interest in how things work, how things are made, materials, techniques about putting things together that he was interested in expressing. And I'm still interested in, in sort of looking at something and knocking on it and saying, oh, that must be, hmm, that's how thick is that piece of wood, you know, that sort of structural curiosity is interesting to me as well. Is it fair to draw a comparison between Mr. Stoller and, and Ansel Adams? I mean, you see Ansel Adams photograph and you see an Ezra Stoller photograph, the use of shadow capturing massive structures, because that strikes me every time I see one. I don't think he was interested in photography very much at all. I have, a, I have a very hard time making comparisons uh, for the reason that I'm less interested in knowing who is best, <laughs> but more interested in what kind of message is that person uh, telling us. And uh, there's a whole evocative world in Stoller's uh, imagery, which is distinctively his own. Because of my relationship with, uh, with Schulman, people often ask me, who is better, Stoller or Schulman? And I don't like that question. I don't think it's a fair question. I don't think it's a useful question either. I think that they had a different relationship with space, and they accounted for it according to their own inner emotional structure. What I would say is that uh, Ezra had a very, very clear picture of how things were going to be represented from the very early uh, stages of his photography, and uh, he grew as a photographer with the architects because he saw the evolution of a modern, the modern movement in the United States following World War II with a particularly attentive eye to uh, capture what was uh, the true innovation 
versus what was just a rehashed pattern of, uh, you know, architectural detailing and things like that. And he would point the camera right there to just show it on your face. This is where the newness of this space is. And he would comment on that. He never mentioned Ansel Adams, but he talked about Adje as a major influence. F.S. Lincoln he also mentioned. Also. And uh, he, he was somewhat connected to the world of fine arts photography. There were some cards by Irene Penn uh, to him, uh, congratulating him for his work. But he was, I mean, he was understated, but he knew that he was great. Let's put it like that. <laughs> it's, I would say that was false modesty. Well, it was false, false modesty at one, one way. At the same time, I think it was a kind of uncertainty and, and not being really so sure of himself in, in a general sense. So this became the way he expressed himself. But what you said is true, that he, he would act very modest about it and say, oh, it's not my work. I'm just speaking for the architect. I'm just the, I'm just the what did he say? I'm just the, I'm not the composer. I'm just the conductor. You know, there are these letters from Wright asking Stoller, yeah. I need these photographs for these exhibits. I mean, yeah, this, uh, right. Wright was already God and Stoller was in his mm-hmm. 20s. And the same thing with Gropius. So you see these mm-hmm. giant people asking a newly graduate to give them these uh, photographs because otherwise they cannot uh, memorialize themselves. And, and that's a power relationship, which is quite extraordinary, historically speaking. And uh, he knew that. You know, I mean, he didn't even graduate with an architectural degree because he thought that maybe he didn't have the patience to do architectural design himself. Although, you know, I'm not so sure because he, he was so refined in his eye and discriminating. I mean, you can only represent with a camera what's out there. And he said clearly uh, there cannot be any good architectural photograph without good architecture. So that relationship was very clear. Uh, yes, but then he took lots of assignments which, where the work was sort of mediocre and worked very hard to make it better. So in a way, those were the people that really needed him, you know. <laughs> yeah, but he was ethical about this, uh, Eric. I have to say, he did not invent what was not there. He would give a competent yeah, yeah. job, but when it was yeah. a great job, then, I mean, he was at a whole other level of uh, production. I mean, yes, you could tell. Yes, that describes it. That describes it well. It's true. Erica, did your father hang out with other architectural photographers? Like, did they all get together for a drink at the AIA conferences no. over the years? <laughs> no, or no. They pretty much kept he did, separate. He had, he had nothing to do with him. Okay. At all. He, 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 you know, he came from a sort of labor union background, and he was part of an organization called the American, well, it was ASMP. It was the American Society of Magazine Photographers. Now it calls itself Media Photographers. So he was interested in rights for photographers in general, he was interested in preserving your copyright, in not having your work misused. But as for sort of palling around with the architectural photographers, not at all. And in fact, not much with any of them. Did he hang out with the architects themselves? To some degree, yeah. To some degree? I mean, I, only, I, was, I was not part of any of that, but I, I mean, remember people coming to visit at our house, Mr. and Mrs. Payer coming for supper, Paul Rudolph will come to somewhere, you know, I mean, there was some of that. But those people, that, in a way, that was that was sort of paying him back for the work he was doing for them. These were not really his friends, you know. These were, it was a business arrangement. Paul is excluded from this because he was really a, a, a friend. But, you know, most people are friendly when they need you, right? Right. And so there were personal connections to some degree. But he was very busy all the time. I mean, he didn't really hang around much at all with anybody. He was trying to build up his clientele and build and do the work. And then because he was always dissatisfied with the printing that he got from commercial labs, he opened a lab himself. And then that was another sort of issue. How do you run that? Who runs it? How do you maintain the standards to keep it viable? You have to take in other work. How do you maintain your presence as the, the pacemaker of the whole thing? So there were, there were the sort of business concerns when it got a little out of control, got a little bigger because he wanted to have the capacity to do his work larger, to do things better himself, and then couldn't really afford it. So that was another thing. Well, I have one last question, and this is for Per Luigi. Mm-hmm. We've talked about how Ezra Stoller really strategized his projects and each shot and how it was going to come about. So when he would go into it, he knew really exactly what he wanted to do and how he wanted to represent this. What was your strategy in designing the book? What is the experience 
of the reader going to be like in the book that you and Erica wrote? To me, the, the first step is always to understand the full breadth of what the archive has. I mean, obviously, when, when I approached Erica, I knew that there was something there. And the question is, is, is that something there organized? Is it accessible? Uh, can I see it? In this respect, for an archive of this magnitude, in the absence of the organization of ESTO, this book would have never been possible. I mean, it's really, ESTO is a particularly well-oiled machine uh, to produce this imagery on which uh, the architecture press and the general press is dependent upon, even, you know, uh, post-Ezra. So the archive had particular names that I knew about because ever since I did Modernism and Rediscovered, I realized that there's a, the official story of modern architecture and then there's the unofficial story. That means there's a lot more people that are in the pool of modern architects than just Philip Johnson and Paul Rudolph. I mean, in the hundreds. And great work, inspired work, but maybe they couldn't afford Edra Stoller and, uh, or Schulman, or they couldn't afford other people. So that's that. And as I looked into the work, when I actually made the proposal to fight on, uh, and in general, when you do a book proposal, you are essentially writing a table of content of the book. This is how I see this book can be organized. And so I executed that plan. And as I was going through that plan and looking at the material, then I adjusted the plan. The plan was always agreed upon with Erica. There's nothing in this book that has not been discussed with Erica and in a very open, transparent way. And I, and I want to acknowledge publicly how um, trustful she was toward me. I mean, and I'm grateful for that, Erica, uh, because... Um, uh, she didn't ask me to to do anything, to say anything. She just gave me the material, uh, access to the material. And so I I integrated the knowledge that I have from previous research into what I know and realized that the serious amount of content that is in this archive. And so we went chronologically. Uh, I wanted to give more exposure to the unknown part, and the uh, publishing house felt, uh, for market reason, it was good to uh, balance with a known work and a known work. And so we gave exposure to some characters uh, that uh, we felt uh, had been uh, neglected, and others uh, uh, showing work uh, in, a, in, in a different way, as opposed to seeing the classics of which Stoller is known for. I have to say that Pentagram, uh, that designed the book, did quite a bit of a, a vetting of the images. And they were very flexible as well and to our feedback. But in the end, you know, each uh, part in this, you know, in this food chain has to play their part, so to speak. So you, you don't really challenge the authority of the person who does what. But the people were very open to suggestions. So we loosely executed the table of content that was presented with adjustments along the way. And uh, the chapters were reduced from five to four. Uh, quite a bit of content was taken out. I mean, you know, words be to give more space to the photographs. I'm sure there will be articles in which I will be able to integrate. Uh, but so that's more or less how we, we learn about, about this work. Pierre Luigi, what proportion of the photographs in the book are previously unseen? Um, I would say maybe 65 percent, between 60 and 70 percent, I would say. That's quite good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the book could have been even more substantive, but, you know, it has to be something that can, people can take with themselves. It's a book that is meant to be kept, that is content that if people want to read it or absorb it visually and to be a reference I also wanted this to be a, a book uh, that could put Stoller under a different light. And I want to believe it's a book that Ezra would have liked because uh, much of what is written is based on his notes. The book is called Ezra Stoller, A Photographic History of Modern American Architecture. Erica's had to slip out, but thank you so much, Pierre Luigi, for joining us again. We always like having you on as a guest. I am always delighted to be part of this game. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by... 
Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for Modernist Houses, 919-995-0550. Visit usmodernist.org's massive modernist archives to hear past shows, discover 7,000 mid-century houses, and access 2.6 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Guests get Googled by Cindy Stratton. Not her real name, so don't Google her. <laughs> U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guile. George and Bob and I'll be back soon with another carefully lit, unphotoshopped edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. <laughs>